Hi, I'm Stuart Molina, music director of the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra. Today, I'm going to give you some thoughts about our upcoming February Masterworks program. Um, this one features mostly music for strings. One of the pieces also features the piano along with the strings. We open with a piece of music called Strum by a composer named Jesse Montgomery. Jesse Montgomery is a New York uh, composer. Uh, she grew up in the 80s in New York City. Um, she's actually having quite an amazing career right now uh, and also is deeply involved in an organization that I'll mention called the Sphinx Organization. Uh, this is an organization that is devoted to uh, working with African American and Latino uh, members of the classical music community uh, to try to, try to get more participation uh, in professional orchestras and in all kinds of classical endeavors. Um, the piece that she's written, uh, Strum, was originally conceived as a string quintet, uh, and then she adapted it to become a string quartet, uh, and then several years later uh, adapted it again uh, to be the string orchestra piece that we'll be uh, performing in this concert. Uh, Strum uh, is so called because most every moment in the piece features some kind of strumming, or what we call pizzicato, on the string instruments. And in general in this piece, it's the pizzicato that sets up the rhythmic pulse of the piece. Uh, Jesse Montgomery talks about the dance-like elements of this piece. Um, and you have different kinds of dance rhythms, but all of these rhythms are complex rhythms, meaning that they're combinations not just of like threes, where you would have a waltz, mm, pop, pop, mm, pop, pop, or a march, one, two, one, two, or even a syncopated uh, uh, ragtime, like, which is basically in four. Um, these are all combinations of triple meters and duple meters. So right at the very beginning, uh, we have a solo viola playing a complex rhythmic pattern. so on. So how does this uh, break down in terms of its rhythm? Well, we have a three, one, two, three, then we have two duples, one, two, one, two. So again, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So you see it's combinations of different kinds of pulses, which give it this kind of almost jazzy feeling to it, certainly a feeling of rhythmic complexity. The second of these rhythms uh, is in a section she calls con moto, meaning with motion. Uh, and this is a combination of two ways of dividing a triple beat. You can divide it one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Or you can do what we call hemiola, which is to divide it in two. So in this case, it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. And this is what it sounds like. and so forth. Uh, the third rhythm that we'll get um, is one where you have a 3-4 measure, three even beats of two pulses, and then one beat of three pulses. So one and two and three and one, two, three, one and two and three and one, two, three. And so on. Uh, and then the, uh, the final section, uh, features a very exciting, uh, similar kind of rhythm as we had earlier, but this time it's a two sets of three and then two sets of two. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, and it sounds like this. And so on. Um, it's a wonderful piece, though, not just because of its rhythmic intensity and variety. It also is an extremely lyrical piece, um, and I'll just share one basic theme with you because it does come back again and again, uh, and you hear it uh, for the first time in the, in the fairly quick section, uh, and it, you hear it first in the violins. And you'll hear different variations, particularly of the first three notes, or different kinds of variations like that. Um, 
We need to move on, but I hope you will enjoy this piece. It's a piece that's getting a lot of play these days, um, and I think it's truly kind of a new classic for string orchestra. Hope you like it. The second piece on our program is called In Holberg's Time by the great Norwegian composer Edvard Grieg. Uh, in fact, I think it's safe to say that he is the greatest of the Norwegian composers. Um, Grieg, although he wrote some large works, uh, in particular probably his most famous is uh, the Piano Concerto, um, he is most well known, and I think he's in his, his greatest comfort zone, when he's writing small pieces, which we sometimes call miniatures. Uh, he wrote many sets, for example, of things he called lyric pieces for piano solo, just short works of two, three, four minutes, um, showing off an incredible adeptness for writing beautiful melodies uh, and for capturing uh, the Norwegian folk spirit. He was a nationalist composer. This was very much in vogue. Uh, in the mid to late 19th century, where composers no longer were writing what they thought of as universal music necessarily, but music that would reflect their own nationality. So, for example, um, Mussorgsky was writing music that he wanted to sound distinctively Russian, um, and uh, Grieg was writing Norwegian music. Um, and you could say the same for most any country. Dvorak was writing uh, music that was uh, Bohemian or Slavonic. Uh, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but the nationalist movement was a very important movement in music, and Grieg was certainly a part of it. Um, in Holberg's time was written as a piece to commemorate the 200th birthday of Ludwig Holberg, who for us is not a, uh, a household name, um, but in Norway, uh, he is as important to Norwegian culture as, let's say, Molière was in France. Holberg was a humorist, uh, he was a writer, uh, and, uh, and he was someone who everyone in Norway in the late 19th century would have known, uh, and they had a big celebration going on uh, for his birthday, his 200th birthday. This piece, because Grieg was the leading uh, composer of the time, uh, he was going to write a piece to commemorate Holberg's birthday. And he decided to write this piece in Holberg's time, uh, and the title is uh, almost literal. Uh, he wrote a piece... Uh, that he thought would reflect the kind of music that was being written when Holberg was alive. Um, this was the time of the Baroque, the time of Bach and Handel and Vivaldi uh, and all those other wonderful composers of the Baroque period. Uh, and so he chooses as a form uh, a suite. Suites were very big in the time of Bach. Bach wrote English suites for piano. He wrote French suites for piano. Uh, he wrote solo suites for violin and cello I, and, and on and on and on. These were suites of dances, um, not necessarily dances that would be danced to, but dance forms uh, that Bach used uh, to create music. Uh, and so Grieg does the same. He chooses five movements. The first isn't really a dance movement. He calls it a prelude. Uh, and in this movement, he sets up a very uh, vivacious world uh, of, uh, uh, of music that we're going to be living in for a while. It starts with an explosion and rhythmic intensity uh, from the full strings. And so on. Kind of like the Bonanza theme. I don't think he had the Bonanza theme in mind. Um, but at any rate, um, so this opening is lyrical, is beautiful, is majestic, is grand. Uh, and the second movement is exactly the opposite. It's a saraband. A saraband is a slow, stately dance of the Baroque period. Um, and in this, he, he goes to the other extreme, from the very exciting, ebullient opening to a very serene, very understated uh, saraband. say neo-baroque music, I mean this is music that was written in the 19th century, at the height of the Romantic period. Um, but it's written in a style that was uh, popular 200 years before. 
What I love about this piece is that it's not just pretending to be uh, Baroque music, but rather even with the style, with the dances, with all of the things that he, the trappings that he uses from the Baroque period, it's distinctively music of Grieg. You have the same melodic sense. You have turns of harmony that you'd never hear in the Baroque period uh, and a charm, uh, a folk charm that uh, is very much a part of all of Grieg's music. The third movement is a gavotte. Um, he uses a very similar motive to the opening of the saraband. Remember in the saraband we had this one begins. Obviously, it's a much quicker dance. Uh, it's a dance that's in a, a two pulse rather than in a three pulse. But the melodic uh, material comes directly out of the previous movement. Um, as a trio, because a, a gavotte is an A-B-A -A, uh, kind of form, meaning you have a gavotte section, then a B section, which we call the trio section, uh, and then a return to the gavotte. For the trio, uh, he creates what he calls a musette. Musette is another term for a piece of music that was used in the Baroque period. Um, there are musettes certainly by Bach and by many other Baroque composers. This one is even a little bit quicker and has uh, kind of a drone to it. You have the, the cellos playing open C and open G strings. They're two lowest strings, which gives you kind of that uh, bagpipey kind of drone sound. And so on and so forth. So you have a sense almost of a pastoral kind of approach to music with the, the pipe drone um, and a very simple uh, melody on top that, uh, that would be the kind of melody that perhaps would be played with a soprano pipe. The fourth movement is my favorite. Um, it's an air. Um, some have said that maybe it was uh, based on the air on a G string. I don't think it matters. Uh, air meaning just a beautiful melody. Uh, he sets this one in G minor. Um, and, uh, and it's absolutely stunning. Here, too, you, you hear definitely the influence of the Baroque. Um, you can tell that he's living within that world to some degree. Um, but at the same time, uh, it has a very romantic feel to it. Romanticism being music that's out, outright emotional, trying to get emotions to the forefront. And this one uh, is, is, is stunning. idea. Um, it, it, it has a great deal of freedom, a great deal of beautiful, luxurious melodies, um, and, uh, and I just think it's a, a stunning work. The final movement is a rigodon. This is a, a fast dance of the Baroque period. This one would come out of the, uh, the French suites, actually, so would the saraband and the musette. Um, and this one features a solo violin and a solo viola. Uh, playing first with each other, and then they play uh, back and forth from each other. Uh, it's a wonderful, sprightly way to end this wonderful suite by Grieg. Um, and uh, I, I think that deservedly, the Holberg Suite is one of the great works for string orchestra. It's played quite a lot uh, by dint of its, its beauty and its appeal. And I do also think that it's one of Grieg's greatest works. I don't know that everyone would agree with me on that, but I think in its combination of charm, melodic content, um, and, and, uh, and honesty, uh, I think it's very hard to find anything that's really much better. The final piece on our program uh, is by Swiss-American composer Ernest Bloch. He was born uh, in Switzerland. Um, he and his family moved to America uh, in the 1920s. Um, he went on to found the Cleveland Institute of Music, one of the storied institutions of music study in the country. Uh, he then went on to lead the San Francisco Conservatory, another fantastic school. Uh, so Bloch had an incredible career, both as a teacher, as an administrator, 
um, and also, of course, as a great composer, one of the great composers of the 20th century. Um, Bloch was known as a Jewish composer. He was, in fact, a Jewish composer. But in many ways, his music reflects Judaism. And I think Bloch was, uh, was quoted as saying that it isn't so much that he was trying to write Jewish music, although there are a few pieces um, which specifically have uh, Jewish themes, but rather Judaism was such a part of him that it was inescapable for him uh, to write anything but Jewish music. But one of the reasons that his music has this sound is that, first of all, it's tonal music for the most part meaning that it's based on chords and harmonic relationships that come out of the 18th and 19th century. But he uses modal scales sometimes. So instead of, let's say, a C major scale, he might use a scale that brings down both the third and seventh, which gives it a kind of strange sound. And he also uses uh, uh, modes that are not even Greek modes, but rather more Middle Eastern modes, like which has uh, very much a, uh, a Middle Eastern sound to it, um, and thus easy to hear uh, Judaism in it as well. The piece that we're going to do is called Concerto Grosso uh, for String Orchestra and Piano Obligato. An obligato means a, a, a part that is played along with another part. Um, concerto grosso is a Baroque form. Um, Handel wrote many concerto grossos. Uh, and the idea of a concerto grosso is a piece of music that has two groups uh, of musicians that are playing sometimes together, sometimes in alternation with each other. Um, the word concerto goes on to mean something different as you move forward into Mozart and Beethoven and the Romantics. There it's a piece for a soloist uh, or a couple of soloists to play with a larger orchestra. But the concerto grosso can be two equal-sized groups of instruments. Uh, and in this particular case, I'm not sure if it always applies because it's not so much a concerto grosso of strings as one group and the piano as the other group. Most of the time, the piano is playing with the strings, uh, playing a, uh, a part that would normally in the Baroque be assigned to the harpsichord, one that covers a harmonic movement and, and reinforces what's already being played. But at other times, the, the piano is being used very much as a solo instrument, and I'll show a few of those as we go. Um, but I do think that Concerto Grosso captures, uh, like the Greek Holberg Suite, which is a neo-Baroque piece, this is also a neo Baroque piece, sort of. Not quite as uh, obviously built out of the harmonies of the Baroque. Um, the story of the genesis of this piece is an interesting one. He was teaching uh, his composition students, and they were claiming that tonal music had no place anymore in the 20th century, that you couldn't capture really modern sounding music by using tonality. Uh, and Bloch took issue with that and went home that night and wrote the first movement, the prelude of the Concerto Grosso, brought it in the next day to his students, and the students were delighted. Um, they all copied parts very quickly, and that day they handed it out to the string orchestra at the school, um, who then played it. Everyone was, was delighted with the piece, and Bloch would go on to write the rest of this, uh, this wonderful work. Um, but I do think it's, it is quite an accomplishment that he's able to write completely tonal music. I mean, there are, there's, there, there are a couple of places where he goes up with, with some advanced tonality, uh, combining chords that might not normally be combined. Uh, but most of the time, it's very standard tonality, and yet it has a very modern sound. And here, too, I think it's because of, of the uh, modes that he uses. So at the very beginning, we're in D minor. D minor scale would sound like that. But uh, he doesn't always stick with that. Um, he uses chords like in D minor. You could have that, but more likely you'd hear. And so by going, with, he goes with a B natural rather than a B flat, and that immediately gives it a tonal sound. So let me play a little bit of the opening. Very dramatic, the entire orchestra and the piano. So forth. 
So what are the modernistic sounds here? One is the fact that he's not in a single time. He has a measure of four and a measure of two. One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two. That's the first thing. The second is, again, this use of the, the raised B natural in the, in the scale. And so... Already you have this modal kind of sound to it. Um, so this first movement goes on. Uh, there's one very dramatic point in the middle of the first movement, and it's really the only time in this first movement that you get a sense of a piano concerto at all, where the piano gets to be like full, uh, full tilt Greek piano concerto or Rachmaninoff piano concerto. <laughs> tell you it's a lot of fun to play I oh I didn't tell you I'm playing the piano in this um, which is a great joy for me to get to play with the uh, with the orchestra rather than just conduct so I conduct from the piano uh, and that's one of the great fun moments of uh, being Vladimir Horowitz in the middle of this uh, concerto grosso um, so this first movement is a shortish movement um, and it sets the stage for a very dramatic very emotional piece and yet at the same time uh, also sets the stage for a piece that's very traditional in form. The second movement he calls Dirge. Now, a dirge obviously is a, 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 a very slow piece, a very sad piece, sometimes associated with funerals. Uh, in this particular case, um, I would say it's a stately, slowish kind of movement. Um, it also is my favorite movement um, in this piece. Um, there are two contrasting ideas that you have in this movement. The first uh, is based on a dotted rhythm. It starts out with this, uh, this theme. hear this a lot. You'll hear it sometimes very soft. You'll hear it in different voicings in the, uh, in the strings. Sometimes, for example, there will be a chord where instead of having the violins on the top, you'll have the violas on the top, which gives it a darker, a little bit more soulful sound. Um, you'll also hear it extremely strong and sometimes with somewhat uh, uh, dissonant harmonies like so forth. Um, the middle section, as dramatic as the opening section is, is absolutely serene uh, and, and splendid and mysterious. Uh, it starts with the piano and a solo viola playing simple triplets. And then on top of this, we have a solo violin and three other solo violins playing uh, what, what I think I can describe as simply spectacular music. Here, too, you hear Bloch, the Jewish composer. That's a very Jewish modal kind of thing, then. I love it. Um, and so you have this long, uh, very ethereal section in the middle. Every so often it will be interrupted by our dotted rhythm from the beginning of the movement. Um, but uh, at the end, he will return to the opening material and end uh, first dramatically before it winds down to an extremely quiet C-sharp major chord. C-sharp major, it's interesting that he's in C-sharp major at the end of the second movement because he started the piece in D minor. Uh, and, you know, those of you who know harmony know that C-sharp is about as far away as you can get harmonically 
from D minor, even though they're just one step away. The difference between and that harmonically is very distant. So he's gone a long way far afield a harmonically by the end of the second movement. We end with this chord with an E sharp on top. And that E sharp is picked up by the first violin, which begins the third movement, but the E sharp magically transforms into an F. Sorry. <laughs> At any rate, it doesn't quite sound like that. Um, it opens with a pastorel. This third movement he calls pastorel and rustic dances. The opening section is a pastorel, meaning uh, a, a countryside kind of piece. Again, you have this viol at the beginning, kind of imitating uh, perhaps a, a, a shepherd's pipe. It also has a sense of uh, perhaps Jewish liturgical music. texture, a lot of solo instruments playing, and then you hear almost at a distance the violas play this rustic dance theme, and then it's echoed by the first violin. Then there's a big build-up, uh, and it's built on a uh, what we call a 13 chord, but I'm not going to get too much into the... This is a chord that is going to resolve somehow, and then it's going to... Building in excitement, you have these chords that need to resolve, uh, chords that, that build intensity, build excitement, and we also build tempo, um, doing little uh, turns on the opening pastoral theme, uh, and then eventually we hit our rustic dance. delightful uh, folk kind of tune. On the other hand, it's a little bit weird because it's not just one, two, one, two. Every so often he throws in a three. So you have one, two, one, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, one, two. And then going on. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Etc. Etc. Sometimes three, sometimes two. Um, this is a, a modern kind of thing. The, the theme is certainly not all that modernistic. It sounds very folky. Um, but the way that it's put together compositionally uh, is, is a rather modern way of looking at things. So I'm not going to do too much more of this, except in the middle of this movement, things come to a very quiet moment where the entire orchestra is playing an E pedal, meaning just, just the E, and you have the viola section, in our case, four solo violas playing. Another melody that comes in. Uh, and the way that he harmonizes this melody is using what I would call open horn harmonization. When you talk about a natural horn or a natural trumpet, they can only play certain notes. And so the way that these notes fit together sixth and thirds, but in that case you can only do a fifth. You'd never hear. So listen to that, the difference between that and and so I think he's using these natural horn uh, notes, these uh, overtone scale notes, again to create the sense of pastoral music. In, I imagine in these times, in a pastoral setting, um, they didn't have instruments with lots of uh, 
lots of keys to hit, certainly horns with valves wouldn't have been used. And so I, I do think that it was a nice choice in that particular case. The piece comes to a very exciting and very grand ending. Um, and then we have our fourth movement, which is a fugue. Um, now, of course, anytime you hear the word fugue, you think Johann Sebastian Bach. He was the king of the fugue. And in fact, in many ways, you can credit him for the development of the fugue as a form in and of itself. Um, after Bach, most every composer had to learn how to write fugues. You'd take a course called Counterpoint, and you'd learn the way that notes are combined with each other, and it would culminate in writing of fugues. Um, but there are good fugue writers, and there are great fugue writers. And I really think that Bloch proves himself to be a great fugue writer with this final fugue. Now, although it is a Baroque fugue in form, immediately you hear that it is, a, is not a Baroque fugue in terms of subject matter. It is tonal. Um, he uses sequences, and I'll show you what those are in just a moment. Um, but the main theme, the, the fugal theme that's going to come back again and again and again, is one that you would never hear Bach use. Uh, this is how it goes. And so, um, why is this a fugue subject that wouldn't be used now? First of all, it has all of these weird jumps. And these are awkward in the world of Baroque fugue. The other reason is that, um, again, it's in a modality that isn't one that Bach really used. We're in D minor. You wouldn't have that kind of a seventh starting on the second tone and then another seventh in that. And then you have your B, B natural again, which we heard in the first movement. And so it gives it again, a, a, it's, it's a little bit of a weird sound if you put it into the world of Baroque fugue. Um, I guess in the 1920s, we know when Schoenberg was writing 12-tone music, it's not quite so weird. In fact, it's a big step towards uh, tradition. Um, but within that world of tradition, it is very modernistic. And so, it progresses like a normal fugue. You have the violas playing, and then the second violins join, then the low strings join, then the first violins join, finally the piano joins, and those seventh jumps become really awkward because you're making all kinds of jumps with, uh, with two hands. Um, and then it progresses uh, as a fugue. I talked about sequences before. Um, sequences are, are turns of phrases that uh, progress harmonically. Um, so you have repetition of melodic material, but as harmony changes. And so, um, for example, uh, let me find a good one to show you. That's one that goes upwards. You have a line here, then it goes up a line, then it goes up a line, and the harmony changes successively. Um, here's another one. That one pro progresses down. This is very much out of the world of Bach, um, and, uh, and Bloch uses it very well. Hmm. I never quite thought you have the B and the H in both Blach and Bach. Anyways, uh, there is one other section that I would like to uh, show you in this particular piece. Um, and this is one where you really get a sense of the Concerto Gross when it's kind of, well, other than the use of solo instruments, which I suppose you could say has that sense of a Concerto Grosso of the small group of solo instruments and the large group of full orchestra. Here you have an alternation of solo instruments playing and then the full orchestra playing. Now, what you can't hear is that the first three lines are, are just our solo instruments. So this is solo. 
then the whole orchestra. <laughs> back and forth. So there you do get a sense of the small group and the larger group. Um, it comes to a very exciting finish. Of course, we do have a return midway through of uh, a moment that's reminiscent of our first movement where uh, the, the strings are playing, playing triplets and the piano gets to play. so on, which is very much out of the first movement in terms of rhythm uh, and in terms of material. Um, but in the end, we all come together. Uh, it has a very exciting finish in D major. We started in D minor, ending in D major, again, typical of the Baroque period. Uh, I think this is a masterpiece, a piece that probably most of our audience has not heard before. Um, and I'm just so glad to bring it to them. I hope you'll all enjoy the concert, and thank you for joining me for this, uh, this talk. <laughs>